get started. Okay, hello everyone. And please come. Here. Yeah, so hello everyone. My name is Yanti Prasad, and this is a session I am taking on AI. I have taken sessions in past also, but the current session is a bit different. It's very focused session on one particular issue that is text vectorization. And the idea is that I will give a presentation of up to 30 to 40 minutes, and after that I will take questions and we can have discussion. And in case there are any confusion and doubt, but this is a very complex topic and the idea is to convince you about certain things basically theoretical thing technically you can uh, download libraries you can use them that's not a that difficult thing but understanding how it actually works and i saw this uh, first uh, on my first slide you see that uh, one equation is written there okay so this king minus queen equal to man minus woman the context should be clear after giving this presentation. That why I have written that, and the title of the presentation is text to back, text to vector. So now let me go to the agenda. So the agenda is that I will cover numerical representation of language, and that is text and speech. The second topic is semantics. The space of meaning. What does it mean by semantics? And then some mathematical background. Most of you have mathematical background, and particularly three main topics. One is this vectors or linear algebra, and second is probability and statistics that will be used, and third is the uh, a calculus, some calculus minor, not much. And then I will cover these uh, generative and descriptive models also, just the application on the basis of probability. I will uh, talk about the statistical models of language, and then I will give some introduction of optimization. And the next topic will be embedding, that is the main topic. And then how we can learn these embedding from the data. And then some uh, discussion about this curse of dimensionality, that how things happen uh, bad when the dimensions are very high. And then some challenges. Okay. So here is the main challenge. If you look around, there are all kinds of data, but generally they are one of the two types. You have numerical data, which are picked by sensors of all kinds, your microphone, camera, whatnot, all kind of, where you measure something, voltage, or intensity, light, count. So you get a number, okay? And once you get number, life is easy. Okay, you can carry out all kinds of mathematical operations, can find out patterns, regularities, similarities, and all those things. Now, here is the other kind of data which is I call text. It could be text or it could be symbols or anything, but the main thing is that it does not have a value. And what it has, it has a meaning. Okay, so you understand this thing that the, uh, this numerical data has. It, it has values and text data is have meanings. Now meanings, but this text data, we can't apply mathematical operations. Like I showed in the first slide, uh, by raw uh, operations, you can't do that like mango plus apple. You don't know what the answer will be. Correct? Up to this point. And then what happens that let me get to the point of the domain of text or the language, which is the topic of this uh, presentation. Now, we know that in this, in its own domain or space, where we have the text or words, we can't carry out mathematical operations or any kind of comparison and all those things. We can do very basic thing, but not very complex, I will explain. So we can project this text either in a space of words, Okay, uh, I will explain what does that mean. Text is made of words. Okay, and you can think about a space where uh, dimensions are these words. Okay, 
So every sentence or word can be represented by if you have a vocabulary of 1000 words, then every word can be represented by a vector of 1000. Length of 1000. So that is what I mean by the uh, space of words. And it can be single words or you can have pair also, which are called bigram or uh, trigram. So it will be very uh, discrete type of the space. If it's a space, okay, like if the word is present, you will have one. If it's not present, you will have zero in these long vectors. Vectors like first part can be just uh, unigram, then you can have bigram and so and so. Long vector. But again, we are silent about the meanings. Okay, we can't say anything about the meanings here. We can find some similarity, which is called keyword based similarities and token based similarities. You can just say that, okay, uh, this sentence and this sentence both have these common words. Okay, but you know that it's a very stereotype of learning because sometimes it may happen that two sentences they hardly have any word common, but they are the same. They have the same meaning. Okay. So better uh, thing is that it is uh, the true artificial intelligence and intelligence is actually to project this text in a space of meaning. Now there is under space, which we can call semantic space. Okay, where every sentence you map there in that space, and it will have some meaning. I mean, we will have vector representation there, and there will be some meaning. And then all the mathematical operations will be allowed to do that. But there are challenges like the space of meaning. It may not be unique. Okay. So depending on the context and the problem, as I will explain, these uh, these spaces could be different. So now let me go to the next thing. Now. Uh, some challenges like two sentences having completely different uh, words may have the same meaning. And a word may have different meanings depending on the context. Okay. For example, he was not far away from the river bank. Uh, or sec second, is bank has increased the interest rate. So the bank is coming in the both places with keyword, but the meaning is completely different. So in that space of keywords, monogram, uh, unigram and ngram, these things will not be captured. Okay. And there was a uh, computer scientist, great guy, his name was uh, Fitz. He said that you shall know a word by the company it keeps. Uh, explain because this quotation is very important in this context. If there are two words and they are used in similar context, like in the neighborhood of same kind of words, then most probably they will have the same meaning. Okay, so that is the type of uh, thing we are looking at basically. And now we can generalize it. What does it mean by that the meaning of any word is actually spread across the sentences and across the neighborhood? Because we are drawing the meaning of your word by its neighborhood. Or the company it is keeping. Okay, now here comes the, uh, this term for uh, distributed representation of words. Now let me go to. Uh, before that, I will just look into that y vector. Now I said that we need representation, and then most common representation will be a vector space and vector where we can project things. Look at this data. It's a typical data, basically, with tabular data which you would have in SQL and Excel. So it has data points in rows. Every row is a data point. And every column is some attribute. This is a famous, this, uh, I think, is a housing data set or some data set. Okay. And all are numbers. So these are the vectors we have like one vector, two vectors. Vector. So the idea is that the length of vector represents dimensionality. So when we will be looking for the uh, vector representation of words, we will be considering dimensionality also that word dimensionality we are talking about. Okay. So I think it is clear here from this thing that uh, 
generally when we talk about vectors in machine learning, I generally ask this question sometimes to you Kumar also, what is the vector? They remember the same definition, it has a magnitude and it has a direction. I said, no, no, we are in machine learning, you should forget this definition. Okay. If you have some object and it has multiple attributes, okay, think about a car or something. It's a length, dimension, engine, number of cylinders, so on and so forth. So any object, if it has its attributes, so we can pack this attribute in a vector. So th that's how we use vectors in machine learning. Okay, so it's uh, obviously there will be uh, some angle and all those things, but the primary thing is that uh, if your data point has is a single value, then it's just number five. But if your data point actually has multiple components, then the best way is to represent it by a vector. Okay, and here in normal vectors, which we have in two dimensional and three dimensions, they are of the similar kind of vectors like uh, length, for example, x, y, z. But machine learning that may not be the, the case. Like here, you can see that this is the some crime rate, and another is this something some completely different uh, attribute. Okay, so it's not necessary that different components of a vector will be having the same meaning. They may have different meanings. Okay, now there is another issue of, of if we have the data, now a data point is a vector, typically. And yet I have shown that data set where we had rules. Okay. So there are situations like the, the last thing where the uh, ordering of rows is not important. So you know that nothing will change if you just swap row number five and 10, because it's the same thing. I mean, conclusions should not change because in which order you write mark sheet of the students in a table, it's irrelevant. Correct. So this is one kind of data, but the ordering is not important. Now there are other kind of data where actually ordering is important. If you look at any image made of pixels, okay. So any pixel will have correlations with neighboring pixels. They are tried up and down. If you just uh, shuffle these pixels, randomize them, picture is gone. Okay, it has no nothing there basically of the random pixel. So in that case, it's important that uh, there are correlations between different data points. So basically, the main point to highlight is that when you collect data, okay, sometimes it is not uh, relevant that in which order you collect the data. It can be in any order. But in some cases, it's important that in which order you collect data and you present the data. Okay, like uh, this image or time series data again. It is again correlated data. Okay, what 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 happens? What happens today is uh, some sort of uh, correlated with what happened uh, yesterday and what will happen tomorrow. Okay, or there can be. Sequence, it's kind of sequence data, like in image data, there will be a correlation along both the direction, X and Y, but in uh, time series data, it's one with one dimensional ordering. And exactly, uh, exactly that is the case for the text also. Like the normal English text, it goes from left to right. Okay, so what will be like 10th word in a uh, sentence? Very much depend on what was in the ninth, in the ninth position and eighth position and so and so forth. Okay, so now we will be looking at different kind of data, text data where there is some kind of correlation. Now let us look at the actual data set and see the example how we go about this uh, problem. So this is the type of text data we have. These are sentences, and if we combine all the sentences together to make a pool, it's called corpus. Or corpora, sometimes there are many corpus, it's corpora. So, what we do first in that, in any corp, uh, corpus, the first thing is that to build a vocabulary. Okay, what we are doing actually, we are marching toward vectorization of text or numerical representation of text. Okay, and the first step we have taken, the first step is to make a vocabulary. Okay, to find out 
how many words are there and maybe what is their occurrence. OK, like I have created this vocabulary and obviously in vocabulary, every word should come just once. OK, and using this vocabulary, we can assign ID to every token or word. Now you see that here we have uh, these some kind of numerical vectors. The words are gone. Okay. Sentences are represented by vectors, but they are not some uh, some kind of truly numeric. You know that because this 17 and 16, they are just placeholder. And there is no way we can apply any mathematical operation on these kind of vectors. It, it will be even illegal, correct? What does it mean? <laughs> One it, see, we can't put this ordering of greater than, uh, less than, Okay, like I can't write, for example, the height is less than wall. Although their IDs are like four and five. That will have no meaning. But this is, we are moving toward basically the first step. At least now on what we don't have look at the words, we have the numbers. Okay, and computers are good at crunching number and processing numbers. So finally, whatever is done is actually the number crunching. Let me go to next thing. And then uh, this Jupyter notebook is on that GitHub page, which I shared. You can get that. So we can get uh, like these vectors. And then we can get something called one hot encoding. So what is one hot encoding is that simple. If you have a vocabulary of size 100. Okay. So every word can be represented by a vector of size 100. So the word will has its position on that vector. OK, so like you can see that. Uh, it was dog cat fight, for example, and the first word is it and it is represented by this vector. OK, where only one entry is one. Rest of the entries are zero. And for another vector, one of the entries, uh, some different entries will work and will be zero. Now, there is something we can do on this, this kind of one hot, uh, one hot encoding. Like in case of this identity, which we, when we replace this word by their ID, is still some operations were allowed there. Like search, for example, you could do search. That whether the uh, this word is present here by searching its token. But here actually you because it's a binary vector. Now if you for a sentence, if you create this type of vector, you can find out, for example, if you add like now cat is a vector, uh, it was all are a vector of the same dimension, you can add them. So exactly at those places where you have a word, you will have one. Okay. All other places you will have zero. So if you do the scalar multiplication, okay, scalar product of vectors, or even the difference, you can find out what is common there. So some operations are possible there, but not enough. Now go to the next. Now come to the next actual vector uh, operation. Excuse me. So I'm just giving a review of vector and matrix algebra in case uh, some of you have forgotten it or this is this kind of object is a uh, matrix to the two dimensional and then we have vectors okay and you know the vector product like uh, the first row will go with first column okay and we add them and we get this number you all know that how the vector matrix Product is done. So I will just highlight some of the important property of this uh, vector matrix product. So one thing is that you can increase, and I have used mathematical uh, notations like x belong to R to n means it's a n-dimensional vector. Y is m-dimensional vector, and y will be a multiplied by x, where a must be m cross n, di n dimensions. Okay, and it is always possible. If uh, whatever value of n and m we take, we are free to choose. 
we can always find one matrix a which will help to some sort of transform this x into y from a small vector into a bigger vector or a bigger vector into a smaller vector by multiplication correct if we have any such matrix and uh, just summary that by multiplying with an appropriate matrix we can increase decrease or decrease the dimensions of a vector the relationship between the original vector x and the transform vector remains the same like if you multiply them it's a linear operation correct so it will not be like uh, then x1 and x2 are actually perpendicular but then y1 y2 will become parallel no they will maintain that thing and uh, all kind of operations or the transformation of the vectors can be represented by actually matrix if you have a vector which is a data point so you can rotate it by applying a rotation matrix okay you can translate and many of kind of like on images if you look at the images and even if you are using a software photoshop or any other so you will see that there are all kind of operations are uh, available there and they are generally represented by matrix you apply this matrix on that image it will be transformed into something else okay now here comes the thing now i'm switching the gear i was talking about the vectors vector is a n dimensional object okay now we have to connect this vector with probability and statistics probability particularly because in machine learning all the predictions and results are statistical in nature they are not definitive like when we do image identification if there are images of animals like cat dog cow for example three classes okay what our answer will be when we run a image classification task that 80% chances that it's cow and 10 and 10 are for other so it will always in term of a probability or a number correct and the actual data was actually vector if you look at the image of a cat cow or any data you have although i mean it's a uh, image but technically it's a vector okay it's a two dimensional you can call it one dimensional but it's a vector basically so your data input data is always a vector and your output data in classification will be a probability score okay and there are many functions which can map a vector to a probability score and one of such function is called sigmoid okay so you can check this function that this yi no matter what its value is whether minus infinity or plus infinity this sigma will, is going to be always between 0 and 1 okay and this yi is actually our model for example if we are doing a linear regression so this will be yi like this one okay so this yi and then we can put that thing there we can get a probability score and in case we have a multi class then we have something called soft max function so it is similar basically it also gives a probability score but in case of sig sigmoid it is only for the binary classification okay two class only but the uh, this soft max gives a probability for a, if you have a 10 10 classes okay so here actually you will have a probability vector also you will not have just a probability one number what a vector but obviously it will be unit vector in the way that if you add all these number it will should add up to the one okay so let me move next thing so this is how this sigmoid looks most of you have seen it i guess now here it comes uh, this probability thing and a bit hard part to understand basically now we are going from Uh, this vector and matrix to probability okay and i have shown that there are many functions like sigmoid soft max which can help you to jump there but let us uh, do some review of this probability def uh, definitions so i am not giving the definition of probability what is a p of a okay p of a is like in frequentist uh, language that how many time a favorable event happen divided by all the events happening like if, if you are tossing a coin 
and your favorable event is like head. Okay, so it will be one by two. Probability will be one by two, and so on and so forth. Basic, but here we are more interested in conditional probability. Why? Why we are uh, uh, interested in conditional probability? Is that because in the language, if you look at that, everything is conditioned. Like I ask you a question, your answer will depend on what my question is. Correct. Translation also, or even if I want to say something. It will depend on that what I have said uh, before. So it is conditioned. So like given that B has already happened, okay, what is the probability that A will happen? So this is the definition of conditional probability. Given that B has already happened, okay, what is the probability of A will happen? Correct. And it depends on two things. One is the joint probability of A and B. In your, uh, if you have dice, six face dice, you can ask this question, okay, what is the probability of getting some even phase which has a value higher than three? So you can do this calculation, calculation because now there are one case with A, it's, it should be even phase, like two, four, six, and then higher than three. So there is another thing. And this is a very symmetrical, you know, that uh, joint probability of two things happening together. Either you take A first or B first, doesn't matter. Okay. So we can use this symmetry and we can get the equation like PAB is PBA, PA, and this thing. You can easily find this thing, but nothing else. It's a conditional probability, but it gives you one interesting thing. It's called Bayes theorem, and it's one of the most famous uh, mathematical. Equations, I will say in uh, machine learning and these things. So, if you know one condition, like you already know PBA, okay, you can get PAB from that. So, I will explain it. So, there are two things when you carry out a experiment there is a data and there is a theoretical model. Okay. So now you are interested in what is the probability of this theoretical model represented by theta being correct given the data D. This is what you are interested in. Given this image, what is the probability that this image belongs to a cat? Okay, not a dog. This is what you are interested in. This is what you want to predict. Now, here is the under function which is called the probability of data given that model. So, if you can compute this thing, that given that basically, given that we know this image is of cat, okay, what is the probability of getting this type of data? It's like reversing the same process. And then you know something called prior that what is the probability of uh, this cat? Like, see, it also matters here. For example, you have images and you have 80% of the images of cats. Okay. And only 20% are of other, other animals. So, in th this case, apart from this factor, you have to consider that also. So, you should give higher weight to the cat. Because the, in the sample, you have more caps. So that is called prior information or uh, prior, basically. So what we are doing that, this is exactly what sits at the heart of learning algorithm in machine learning. What is le machine learning? We are updating our belief about certain things. So we already know about something about, we know some something about an uh, object, event, whatever. Then we collect the data. And we update our belief. Okay. And then we get more data. We, then we keep updating our belief and we keep building it up. Okay. Till we are fully informed. So this learning is happening incrementally. Like in machine learning, what happened that uh, there are many uh, algorithms like back propagation. Okay. Where Basically, we are trying to minimize the mismatch 
in every iteration. So I think you understand this machine learning is some way it represents machine learning basically that uh, your post read here becomes prior for the next data point. Okay, so and then you keep iterating this thing. And this is very much used in language modeling. Now I will come on this point because I talked about two, two probabilities. One is the conditional probability and second is the joint probability. OK, so on the basis of that, what we are using, this, uh, are there joint or conditional? There are two kind of machine learning models or AI, they are very well fascinable. One is called discriminative AI and second called generative AI. So nowadays, you may hear a lot about generative AI due to chat GPT, GPT, and all those things. Correct. So this is exactly uh, the right point to some sort of introduce it, generative AI, what it is and how it is different. So discriminative AI is actually interest. We are interested in PYX. What is the probability of this image being of a cat given this data? This is what we are interested in. And then probability of this being dog given the same data. Correct. So we compute this PYX for all the ones, for all the labels in image classification and see for which case it is maximum. And that will be our true label. Correct. So this is the discriminative AI. One of the application is image classification. Second thing is the PYX. Okay, now we are interested in joint probability. We are what we are trying to understand is the underlying process which is creating patterns. Okay, how we learn in the world, for example, if we go around and we see all kind of things. Okay, we see dragons, cranes, people, and everything. We make a model in our mind. I will give you an example that if you go around and see the fruits, okay, and look at the shapes, you make a table of shapes like cubical, rounded, cylindrical, and pyramid shape, and, and count the fruits you have seen of this time, okay, given put a number there. So you will find that overwhelming number of fruits are actually rounded. There is some probability of some odd thing also, but once you understand the probabilities, two kind of probabilities. One is that these independent probability, as they said that what is the probability of rounded fruits? Okay, you count from a sample. The second thing is that conditional probabilities. Conditions mean in different situations, like if you said it, if it's a this, this geographical region, the probability of rounded fruit may be different. Because there may be some place where people find all, all, all the fruits are like cylindrical fruits. Okay. So there is a condition. So in uh, generative AI, what we are learning, we are learning about the pattern in data and their probabilities. So you make a very big machine like GPT. Okay, a lot of computing power and pump all the data in there. I ask this model to look into everything there, all the pattern, because there is huge computing power. So what it will learn? It will learn patterns and their probabilities. Okay, their independent probabilities and their joint probabilities. Okay, and once it has learned all those probabilities, what is called marginalization of probabilities? It's a term there where you have a joint, very big joint probability like P. As a function of x, where x are like thousand of things there, okay. But you can some sort of marginalize some of these dimensions if you are interested in just two three variables. So idea is that once you have the joint probability distribution, you have everything what you need. Okay. Like in quantum mechanics and physics, people have a wave function. Side. So once you have the wave function, you are done basically. You can apply certain operations on that and you get what you want. So in this generative AI, what we are trying to understand is that we are learning actually the joint probabilities. OK. So is, is there any question of this thing is clear that what is discriminative or what is generative? Generative is not. Descriptive is clear. 
generative you are as i gave example that you are actually learning the joint probabilities okay joint probability as i said that uh, i will give you an example of fruits again let us take two attribute one is the shape and second is the color okay now you have a pile of fruits and you make a table their shape and color shape color how many like uh, red rounded 38 Or red cylindrical five. Okay, once you have this table, this table is nothing but joint probability distribution. Whatever attributes. Yeah. The table page. Of there occur else. Is there occur else? Yes. But that's what is used in uh, language model also. And likely, would I just said that the, there is a parameter or the model, there is a data, and then there is a data model and this thing. Okay. And what we try to do is actually we try to maximize this likelihood. Okay. We are forcing some sort of we have the data and model. For example, I will say that blue and sky. Okay. Let us consider that our prediction is sky after blue. So we will tune our better such that that the likelihood is maximum for when we put these two things. Okay. So again, this Gaussian likelihood it, it may look uh, something strange, but actually it is not. If you have done this uh, 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 line fitting exercise or linear fitting or chi square fitting like this, this is exactly what it is. In most of the cases, x i is a data point and y i we have a data set of x i and y i. So we are trying to fit a line to it. So what we do? This is the error term. Okay, this is some actual true value, and this is the predicted value. We subtract them, square them, and then generally we try to minimize this sum. But actually, it is a likelihood. Okay, it sits here e to power this thing. If you take the minus two log likelihood, this is your familiar. mean squared error type of thing basically what is in machine learning called mean squared error and you try to uh, minimize this thing okay this chi square and you get the value of w and b so the idea is that there is a function called likelihood function which is a function of your theoretical model and data okay and you try to maximize it for your theoretical parameters so whatever value of parameter which will uh, give you higher likelihood will be the correct uh, parameters but you may not know what these parameters are you will start with the uh, random values of them and will iterate them when you get data you iterate and you keep updating them okay now language model now i i have sort of built the whole machinery here to attack the problem of language models so nowadays uh, we talk about large language model but before going to large let us understand what are language models okay so there is a definition models that assign probabilities to sequence of words are called language models or lm so uh, like i said that the sky is blue the door is open and i want numbers for these two sentences Okay, I want number between zero to one probability for these sentences. So any machinery, any model, which will give me a number, a probability for sentences, is called language model. Okay. So or if uh, if I write ten words and I am interested to know the eleventh word, so any model which which will give me a word for the eleventh position will be called language model. This is how the auto completion happen basically. So there is a language model learning. You just try few things and the other things come because it predict on the basis of that. And how it does that? It has seen in the past. If it is I and D, I most probably the letter is going to be A because in training data most of the time it has seen in D. It has not seen like I and D, I, T or something. It was not there. So these are the language model and. obviously trained on bigger data sets are called for large language models okay so 
what we are interested in uh, language is simply the probability of a sequence of words. So this is what we are interested in. Okay, we have to create generate answer for a question using some large language model, some model. Now any answer will be made of sequence of words. For example, let us consider that we have 1000 sequence of words and one of them will be the answer of the question. Okay, so if we have the probability for these sequences, okay, then we can find out which one will be the answer. Like uh, this P W1, W2, W3 means three words. So basically look at the two words. What is the probability of two words coming uh, like blue and sky? So it is like, okay, blue sky, the first thing is that the condition probability that how many times I have seen uh, blue when actually there was uh, a sky. And then independently, how many times actually there was a sky. So you just do this probability, you get answer. And then you can generalize it to the three, and then you can generalize for n, and you can write this in this way, basically in mathematical formation. So not very difficult. I will give you a reference. There is a very good book. It's online free, uh, Jeff Risky and something. So it's all from there. And again, it may happen that uh, you have this option that like nth word depend only on the eighth word, or it depend on the seventh and sixth also. So there are different kind of models, n gram models, like you can have just by grams, where the nth word may depend on just n minus one. And yeah, so basically it's just a lot of text, but it's there. A statistical model of language and gram. So this is one of the models of language. You are not doing anything exceptionally some sort of sophisticated. What you are doing, you have a computer program and you pass a text to it, lot of text, and actually just count the occurrences of various words. They are single occurrences. They are join, triple, and whatever. So these are for the n grams. Like, and then use those n-gram values or those probability to get the probability of these any sequence you want that p w1 w2 w3 so once you have the, your full table is populated okay so you can easily find out the probability for any sequence of words so these are the statistical models they are primarily depend on the counting here is the, an example you want to Find out what is the probability of the coming after the sentence, its water is so transparent that. And you want to know, I mean, you can have the, you can have any other word, but you want to find out probability for all the words you have in the vocabulary. The formula is that you look at your table, find out how many times this word, this whole uh, sentence has come, its water is so transparent that the, means the sentence with the has come, and how many times only this part has come? And you just divide them and you get the number. So EG were nothing very uh, complicated. And then uh, this question also comes that, I mean, like in numbers, if you have a sequence of number, so any number can come. There is nothing like if it's nine, then only seven and three can come. Anything can come. But that is not, not the case for words. Like all permutations and combinations are not permitted. If you look at the large corpora, only certain formations are allowed. Okay. Now, if your model is giving you a sentence, how you will know that the quality of sentence, even if it's good or not, acceptable or not. So there is a major cost. Uh, perplexity. Okay, so it is computed in this way that whatever sent, uh, sentence or sequence of words you have come, you know its probability. Okay, and you put that probability down under square root of and compute a number, you will find a very high number if this probability is very less. So if it uh, creates some uh, sentence which is very wide, odd, 
Okay, no one has seen it. Shocking. So it will have very high value for this number. Okay. Now there is that thing also that people should not think that why not we can just make all the possible sentences of different length. Okay. But there is a problem that if you look at that, your sentences can be only up to 10 words. Let us assume that. Okay. Let us make all the words with 10, all the sentences with 10 words. And we have a vocabulary of 80,000. Okay. So how many such sentences will be? It will be like 80,000 to power 10. Okay. It is going to be very, very big number. So you know that the dimensity is now very high. And forget about 10, we can have sentences which can have 25, 80, or I don't know how many words up to we can have. So there are many models to convert now these uh, text to vectors, and we have machine grid ready, which is the probability, uh, probability based. And we can count these occurrences in the corpus. Okay. And, and then we, we do this thing uh, based on counting. Okay. But there is a neural network based on, uh, uh, scheme also, which we will explain, where we don't need to do any manual counting. Okay, it will automatically do that thing for you. And it's called word embedding. I will come on that. Can we connect with the Yes. So let us look at the recipe for the word embedding, what we need. And as I have shown in that Jupyter notebook exercise also, we had one hot encoding vectors. Okay. And then now from this one hot encoding vectors, which had just zero and one, we want to make vectors which are of smaller dimensions and tens. Okay. So in some space, which is called latent space, and you can specify in latent dimensions. So the idea is that to project these big vector in some other space where some meaning can be assigned to the words. So that is the, I, I will come on that thing. It's very important to basically, where is the matrix thing? Here it is, it's a matrix, okay? I will give you a very specific example, which you can understand. You have a news headline data set. Okay, there are sports, business, entertainment, and politics news. There are sentences. And you have four classes, Y1, Y2, Y3, Y4. Okay, the news belong one of these four classes. So all the four label can be represented by a vector of four dimensions, where only one of the entries will be not here. Correct? And these x1, x2, x3 are like, uh, this is our data set. And this is our embedding matrix. Okay. So what we can do, we can solve this matrix problem. Let us consider these can be 0, 1 or whatever. Okay. Let us consider that they are 0, 1. Okay. And now, if we solve this matrix problem, we can find some weights. Okay. This weight matrix will act on these vectors of 0, 1 and will give us a vector of lower dimensions, which will have real numbers. So this matrix is called embedding matrix. Okay. So how it will, how, how it will happen, basically, that Again, there is a problem here in matrix and the it's not straightforward. You know that in order to solve any matrix problem, you should have as many equations as there are unknown variables. Correct. And these uh, equations should be independent. 
and there is some constant on the matrix, basically what kind of matrix it should be. So most probably this is going to be what is called ill-posed problem. Okay, but then there are numerical techniques to solve, solve such problems. They can, in computer they are solvable basically. You may not find unique solution, but some solution will come. Okay. So, yeah, iterative approach you can say that the, so uh, here message is there by so basically you can do get a uh, lower dimensional representation of the vector by matrix multiplication given that we actually know those matrix and we learn those matrix like you can see that four dimensional embedding has been found for this uh, Get latent spaces four. So what will happen that when we have some sentence, okay, like it is a sports news or a business news. So that intelligence actually we are putting in the data, okay, and then these vector will get values such that our requirement is fulfilled. In the way that if two news headlines, they belong to sports, okay. So actually they will map to similar kind of vectors. You understand it? So now in place of this sports news, if your labels are different, like positive and negative reviews, and you use the same words, that your embedding is going to be different. So your vectors are going to be different. So the thing to notice here is that when you do the world embedding of the vector representation by any scheme, the vector representation is not unique. It is contextual. Okay, so that's very important to understand. And then uh, there is a, a scheme called world to vec based on neural network. I'm not covering neural network here, but they are there and I will cover at some point, basically. Neural networks are nothing but learning mapping between input and output. Okay. So these world to back, what they try to do is that there are, you have a text. Now you take a world and try to predict it from its neighbors or the surrounding worlds. So you try to maximize the likelihood. Okay, or you can do that other way around also. You take a world and try to predict its neighborhood. So there is a continuous bag of world, and there is a uh, script gram model. Basically, this continuous bag of world, it is trying to predict this world. Okay, I will give you a, you said that today weather was really pleasant. Okay. Now you mask one word between you just don't put that word there and give your model, force your model to predict that word, the exact what it is. So when you do this process, you actually assign some meaning to these vectors, these embedding vectors. So in the first situation, when you start with learning these vectors, latent vector, embedding vector, they are populated as a random node, completely random. Okay, when you enforce them, like the news classification thing, so every data point is actually going to change the values of component of these vectors slightly. And then if there is enough data set, so basically what, what this, like this sports, uh, this news classification data set is trying to find that how much business news attribute is available in some world. Okay. These four different type of features basically. So that is called what is a semantic, semantic thing basically. It is trying to get the meanings. And the script gram model I have already mentioned that. Okay. And then there is a globe one approach of globe. So globe, globe is basically you co-occurrence matrix. You find it that giant matrix. Okay, how many? What is the co occurrence frequencies? And you do two kind of things on it. One is the matrix, matrix factorization. Okay. And then you you understand from the local context also. 
using the same probabilistic approach as I mentioned there. Like co-occurrence matrix looks like it data is next oil. Okay. And then you see that future and is is coming at one time together. And future uh, data and is is coming two time. So once you have this matrix, it's a giant matrix, but this globe thing actually it uses only those entries in the matrix which are non zero by using some clever technique. Okay. And then here you must know one matrix operation. It calls singular value decomposition. Okay, I will just remind that in case you have forgotten it. You take any matrix, it can be split into three matrices. Okay, where left and right matrix are going to be rectangular matrix, and the middle matrix is going to be a square matrix. Okay, like if it's an M cross N matrix, it can be written like right M cross L. Then L cross L and then L cross N. Understand? It's M cross N matrix. So I can write A M cross N is equal to some U matrix, which will be M cross L. And then, then S matrix, which will be L cross L. And then some V matrix, which will be L cross N. So the middle matrix is a diagonal matrix. And it actually has even values of the matrix. And they are nicely organized in decreasing order. Okay, so why we do it? This singular uh, value decomposition can be used to uh, reduce the dimensionality of vectors. Basically, the same big matrix can be. You can put a cutoff like if even value is less than this thing. Okay, so I will not go into that, but it's a very important concept in linear and vector. What it basically means, like in this case, what it means, like when we are reducing. Cutting off on a value? No, we we do uh, we use that here because these matrices, it's four current matrices, they become very, very big matrices. Yes, depending on the vector size we have. Yes. The vector 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 vector. Let's say thousand plus now we do single decomposition cut off somewhere. Then what does it represent that whatever is left now? That size term. Basically, not everything is important. Whatever the features are, it's like principal component analysis or something basically. Okay, so lower dimensional representation. Some words are not important in the data, they are just yeah, maybe not useful. Your probabilities are too small for certain things. So I will not go into uh, detail of this thing, but it's important to understand this concept that uh, how it is used. Okay. And Globe uses that. And globe is available. You can download this library and you pass one word to it, it gives you a vector. Okay. Although it may not be have, I mean, this is the example of there they have compared it word to back and globe. So you see that as I showed in the very first slide, the equation. The king, this is how they are projected in this three-dimensional space uh, by word to back and by globe. So similarities will some sort of they will be identified basically. They will show up in these uh, dimensions. So my matrix factorization method. And now some of these topics are very technical and mathematical. Basically, they will need like full session on just one thing, like matrix factorization or the singular value decomposition. Okay. So I'm not going into that, but glow model, it's very simple to understand from this example. Let us look at the some data set and we compute this probability. So probability of uh, finding the word solid in a sentence when already there is I is present in the sentence. This is the probability. Okay. Probability of finding solid in a sentence where there is steam in the uh, sentence is this one 10 to the power minus 5. So using two things, we can actually find what is the probability of solid. Okay. And it is actually 8.9. So by dividing these probabilities, you can find out what the, what the world will come. Okay. And these probabilities can be used here. Why it's 8.9? Just they divide, they have written this formula. 
division which is a small number it's a big number for you One order is 10 power minus one order is 10 power minus 3. Okay, you here is interesting. If you take this k is equal to solid, so p k solid. So here this is high, but in a world where this thing is fashion, for example, okay, k is a fashion, then you will find this thing 0 0.96. Although it's a bit tricky because they are small numbers, sometimes small number division can make. Uh, but things bad, but here what we are trying to find out is that what is the joint probability of words? So this I picked from the actual globe paper and there is a lot of discussion about this. So the, these are the things what we are interested in, in X, I, J. So now you already know these are these probability like X, I, J probability is like a matrix element. Correct. It has I and J, both are bonds. So in that case, we can make, make the matrix. And yes, yeah, so I'm not going into much detail of that, but the main idea is very clear. Basically, you have the co-occurrence matrices. You compute the properties. These properties give you the uh, basically that under matrix, which you can further use to find the uh, Related vectors or the globe vectors, correct? So nowadays we use the neural network and we don't use much this globe and world to get. I mean, they have their own purpose. Okay. So in any neural network nowadays we are using for this uh, text processing or classification or anything. So we use one layer for embedding layer at all. So this embedding layer is made of large number of matrices which have weights. So what happens that actually when we run this neural network where the output is this side and input is this side, when we do many iteration of it, so in the beginning obviously embedding layer will have matrix populated all over there. Everywhere there will be matrices, all kind of correct weights. So when we do the training, these weights get populated. Incrementally they increase. So here we don't make any uh, difference between the actual weights of the neural network or the weights of this embedding. So once we learn the embedding weights, okay, so we don't need to go all the way there. We can directly bypass here and get the vectors here and use them for whatever purpose we have. For example, if we train this neural network model for the news headline classification data set, okay, our model is trained, we have the weights. So it doesn't mean that we can do only that thing with you. No, I have these weights. I get any text, just pass it to embedding, get a vector and use those vector for whatever purpose I want to use it for. So it's called transfer learning, which is much more popular. Or what I can do is that I get these vector learned from this news classification data set, and then I again fine tune them. Like when I am trying to find the these vectors, they are also like weights, correct? And in place of use, uh, starting with the random values, I can start with the values which are coming from some pre-trained model. So that will save our time. So they, they, they may not exactly work by, for example, this uh, network for trend for news and right data set, and you are uh, using it for some sentiment analysis. Obviously the program domain is a bit different, okay? Because whatever was uh, enhanced there for the news headline classification, whatever the features were pulled out from the text may not be the same feature which are used for sentiment analysis. But there will be something there. And it works very well like the image classification also. We have used some pre-trained model for some new image data set and it works. So, here are some references here, and these are very important references. I, I will say it. The first one book is available on the internet, and it's like Bible of this speech and text processing, and they have open source it basically. The author has open source it. Okay, and 
all the detail is there and this paper is very important by this something called i mean godfather of deep learning this intern and other it's a nature paper basically where they discuss the back propagation algorithm and how that can be used to run certain vectors and this under paper is also important which is published in science non linear dimensionality reduction by locally linear embedding and after that uh, for this was the most important paper basically the whole business of this started with this paper when year 2003 in neural probabilistic language model it is there and the whole machine it's like a review article basically they have summarized all the important ingredients which are needed and that world to back this fifth and sixth these two paper they describe the whole scheme of world to back and then we have this blow vector paper okay i have put one link here of a website which i will show they have implemented many thing there you can just put two sentences there and you will find how similar they are okay so i will just stop here and then